Hello, this is Richard Hammock's Calculus 1 course. We are in part 2 of the course on limits. Today, Lecture 10b, the Squeeze Theorem. This is a continuation of Lecture 10a on limits of trig functions. Our purpose today is to tie up one remaining detail from Lecture 10a. Our plan is to introduce the Squeeze Theorem, which is a theorem that is occasionally useful for evaluating complex limits, and then use the squeeze theorem to prove that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x equals 1. You'll recall from lecture 10a, we used some informal geometric arguments to convince ourselves that this limit must be equal to 1, but our arguments were very informal. Today we're going to carefully prove that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x equals 1. That's the whole purpose of today's lecture. So our goal is to prove the limit as x approaches 0 sine x over x equals 1. And we'll use this new idea called the squeeze theorem, which I'll now develop line by line. To start, suppose we need to find a limit as x approaches c of g of x. And imagine that's a complex limit that you're having a hard time working out, like this one perhaps. So geometrically, you have a function y equals g of x and an x value c, and you're trying to find the limit as x approaches c of g of x. Here's the way the squeeze theorem is going to work. You're going to search for simpler functions, like a y equals f of x that's less than g of x, and also a y equals h of x that's greater than g of x, for values of x that are close to c. So say we can find functions f and h, as illustrated here, with f of x less than or equal to g of x less than or equal to h of x for all x near c. Now imagine for these two functions f and h that you found, their limits as x approaches c are easy to evaluate, and in each one of them, the limit works out to be a number l, as indicated here. Well, the conclusion that you would have to reach is that the limit as x approaches c of g of x also equals l because in this picture, y equals g of x is trapped between the graphs of y equals h of x and y equals f of x, and their limits as x approach c both equal l. So these two functions squeeze in together to force g of x to get closer and closer to the number l as x gets closer and closer to c. So the conclusion of the squeeze theorem is that if the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l, which is also equal to the limit as x approaches c of h of x, then you can conclude that the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals l. That's the squeeze theorem. So its whole point is to evaluate a certain limit. And to apply the squeeze theorem, you have to use a little bit of creativity. You've got to come up with two other functions, f and h, that work in the manner described here, and they both have to have the same limit, l. Given all of that, you can conclude that this more complicated function has a limit that equals l. So the whole idea is you want f and h to be simpler than g, and their limits are easy to evaluate, and they get you to the limit as x approaches c of g of x. So what we'll do today is we're going to apply the squeeze theorem to the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x. This middle function, this g of x, that's going to be sine x over x. And we're going to use some creative thinking to come up with functions f and h, as illustrated here, and then apply the squeeze theorem to conclude that this limit equals 1. In so doing, we'll need some geometry, 
I want to remind you of what's called the sector of a circle or a sector of a circle. If you have a circle of radius r and its center right here, if you take a pi slice of that circle, that's called a sector. And we'll be concerned with areas of sectors today. So to describe a sector, you need a radius of the circle, but also you have to give this angle measurement for the angle of the sector. And for that, we use radians. Those are angles on the unit circle. So let's draw our unit circle here. And let's say that this sector has an angle that's x radians. So the measurement from here to here on the unit circle is x. We will need a formula for the area of a sector. Let's call this area of this sector of radius r an angle x. Let's call it a. And here's the formula for the area of a sector of a circle of angle x and radius r, the one that's illustrated here. The area is 1 half r squared times x. And you, maybe you've seen this formula before, maybe you haven't. I want to point out that it's, it's really obvious where it comes from. The reason this works is if we're trying to find the area of the sector, that's a certain fraction of the area of the entire circle of radius r. So you'd start out by saying this area a of the sector is the area of the entire circle, which is pi r squared, but it's actually a fraction of that entire area of the circle. And what fraction is it? Well, it's x radians out of 2 pi radians all the way around the circle. So the area of the sector is the fraction x over 2 pi of the entire area pi r squared of the whole circle, and that simplifies to 1 half r squared x. That's where this formula comes from. So we're, we're going to use this area formula for sectors to help us find functions f and h that are above and below sine x over x. Let's get started. So here is our area of a sector formula from the previous page. And to start out, think about the illustrated sector here that's on the unit circle. So the radius of this circle is 1. Let's call this sector OCP. And we can compute its area by the area formula. The area would be 1 half the radius squared times the angle x. And the radius is 1 because this is the unit circle. So this shaded sector has area 1 half 1 squared times x. Now what we're going to do next is think about a quantity that's less than that area. Look at this triangle right here. Let's call that triangle OCP. The area of triangle OCP is less than or equal to the area of the sector OCP because it's inside of the sector. And the area of a triangle, we know a formula for that. It's 1 half base times height. Let's see, the base would be 1. What about the height? Well, according to this picture, the height is sine of x, the y-coordinate at this point, p. So the area of triangle OCP is 1 half base times height, 1 half 1 times sine of x. Now we're going to keep going with this and come up with a quantity here that's less than or equal to the area of the triangle OCP. And from this, we're going to get sine x over x trapped between two functions. For the next area, think about the sector I've illustrated here, sector OAB. That lies entirely inside the triangle OCP. 
So its area is less than or equal to the area of the triangle. And we have a formula for the area of a sector from down here, one half the radius of the sector squared times the angle. And um, this sector OAB, it has angle X, just like our, our first sector, but its radius is the distance from O to A. And from the geometry of this picture, that distance is cosine of X. Cosine of X is the X coordinate of this P here. So the area of sector OAB is one half cosine squared X. So the radius is cosine X, so the radius squared would be cosine squared X. And the angle is X. So we get this chain of, of inequalities. This is less than or equal to this, is less than or equal to this. And we're going to work with this and get it into the form that traps sine x over x between two functions. I should point out that, real quickly, that we have less than or equal to here. And you may wonder why we did that. From this picture here, these could just be less thans rather than less thans or equal to because the individual pieces of area of the sectors and the triangles they're less than the one that it's contained in. Um, but imagine that x was act, actually equal to 0, and then this pi slice would just be a straight line with area 0. You'd have 0 less than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 0. So we're using less than or equal to here. OK, continuing with this, we have these three pieces of area as indicated here, but you've got to be kind of careful. Area is positive, and notice that right here we have an x term. x is the number of radians. I've drawn that as positive radians, but it could be negative radians as well. Um, so we really should put the x in absolute value to change that potentially negative number to a positive. So here that x is now put into absolute values. And also, if x were negative, sine x could be negative. So let's put that in absolute values, too. So now we've got an accurate formula for area that doesn't have any negative numbers. To simplify this, let's multiply all parts of this inequality by 2 to clear out those fractions of 1 half. We get cosine squared x times absolute value of x is less than or equal to the absolute value of sine of x, which is less than or equal to the absolute value of x. Now, let's divide everything in sight by the absolute value of x. So that gives us cosine squared x less than or equal to sine of, the abs sine of x and absolute value divided by the absolute value of x. And that's less than or equal to 1. Absolute value of x divided by absolute value of x is, is 1. So you see here we're beginning to get sine x over x trapped between two values, which is what we want. I've got some absolute values here. Now, if x were positive, sine of x in this picture would be a positive number, and so would x. So the absolute values wouldn't even be needed in that case. And notice that if x were negative, it and sine of x would both be negative, and negative divided by negative is a positive. So again, the absolute value brackets are doing nothing. So we can actually drop them. And we get cosine squared x less than or equal to sine of x over x, less than or equal to 1. So now we have sine x over x trapped between the constant function 1 and the function cosine squared of x. And that's the setup for the squeeze theorem. The picture is here. Here's x equals 0 right there. The dotted line is the graph of y equals 1, or the dashed line is the graph of y equals 1. 
the dotted graph is the graph of y equals cosine squared x. And according to what we've done here, the graph of sine x over x has to lie between those two graphs. Furthermore, you can tell here that the limit as x approaches 0 of cosine squared x, it's cosine squared of 0, which is 1. Likewise, the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 is 1. So the limits as x approaches 0 of the function below and above sine x over x equals 1 in both cases. So from this we can conclude, using the squeeze theorem, that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x equals 1. It's squeezed in between the graphs of these simpler functions, cosine squared x and 1. And there we have it. We've just proved that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x equals 1. It's possible that after today, you will rarely, if ever, have occasion to use the squeeze theorem. Its primary purpose for us in this course has been to prove the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x equals 1. Still, it's a good tool to have in your toolbox, and you may occasionally have an exercise or a situation for which it's the right tool to use. So keep it in mind. To conclude, we now have two important limits that bear mentioning. We've just carefully proved that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x equals 1. And in our previous lecture, we used it to deduce that the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x over x equals 0. In part 3 of the course, there will come a point where we need to use both of these limits. So keep them in mind. I'm going to leave you with an optional exercise that you may want to think about. It's kind of interesting. It involves the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x. You might enjoy showing that if x is in degrees, not radians, but degrees, then this limit doesn't equal 1. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x equals pi over 180. And it, again, that's if we use degrees instead of radians. So I'm mentioning this because it gives a compelling reason for why we would use radian measure in calculus. Do you want this limit to be 1 or pi over 180? Clearly, 1 is much simpler. And you get that using radians. That's a big reason that we use radians and not degrees. It's, it's a, a system of angle measurement that makes lots and lots of equations, including this one, work out neatly. So next time, coming up, in Lecture 11, we'll introduce an idea called continuity, and we'll come up with a new limit law for limits of compositions. I'll see you then. Goodbye.